So yesterday, uh, the Reichsbank in Sweden announced the, the winners of the Nobel Prize in Economics, and it was given to these three gentlemen. So the three prize winners for this year are David Card, who's at Berkeley, California, Josh Angrist, who's at MIT, and Guido Inmans, who is at Stanford. And the reason why I want to talk about these three gentlemen in this lecture is that their contribution is very much related to what we are doing in this course. So they received the prize because they changed how we do empirical research in economics. And if you go on to, uh, to study econometrics a little bit more than in a basic course, you will certainly encounter some of the methods that these three men have developed. So what methods are we talking about here? A second. So the, there is always a, a reason given for the contribution of, of these of the prize winners, and it was the same this year. So David Card uh, is one of the most famous labor economists in the world. So he studies labor markets as in what determines people's wages, what determines employment, uh, what determines inequality and such questions. And so he has received the prize for his empirical contributions to labor economics and Angrist and Inmans for more their methodological contributions for studying causal questions in economics. Although I would want to say that uh, Josh Angrist is also very well known for his applied research in labor economics and the economics of education. Now, what you should know about this prize and about the work of those winners is where it all started. So when we look back to the 1980s, the way economics was done was pretty much what most students these days learn in the first two years of their undergrads, just with slightly more sophisticated methods, as in lots of theory and then very simple um, econometric models. That's at least how it started out. And what happened over time was that the econometric methods became ever more complicated. The problem was at the time we had very sophisticated methods, not very good data. And so we couldn't really test all the predictions our theories were making. And so a lot of economists in their policy advice took their theories as the truth and simply made gave their advice based on, uh, on, on, on their theories and then had very little empirical facts to back up their theories. And if they did, it was pure correlations. Now, what changed uh, when uh, those uh, three economists plus uh, Alan Krueger, who unfortunately passed away two years ago, when they entered the scene, so they were all, except for Immens, but Angris, Card and Krueger were uh, graduates from Princeton, which at the time had a very strong group in labor economics, thinking very carefully about questions such as what determines wages, what power do unions have, um, and, and what determines unemployment, and so on. And so they developed methods to study and answer causal questions in economics. So whenever I talk about we need to think about causality here, Ultimately, it comes down to methods that these economists have popularized. Now, what's so special about this? You know, any scientist tries to answer causal questions, but most scientists like physicists, chemists, and so on, what can they do? They run experiments to test their theories. In economics, running experiments is difficult, in many cases impossible. And so what the contribution of those prize winners is, is that they found ways, so-called natural experiments, to answer causal questions, even if we don't have a, an experiment that we can run. That's the contribution of these, uh, of these economists. Now you wonder, how does this work? And I will now walk you through a couple of examples 
that it, that highlight this. You don't need to understand each and every detail, but what you will see from those examples is actually that the methods that are being used are often very simple. They're basically OLS regressions. But what is really special is with what attention to the context and, and uh, to, to the actual setting in which they study a certain question, these, uh, these studies, uh, you know, with, with what attention to, to detail they, they operate. So here is the, the, the problem that we're facing in a lot of, uh, in a lot of econometric studies, which is we want to uh, look at the effect of, of a treatment. So here is, you know, an example of, you know, does someone go to the gym and then does that make that person healthier? Or what education does someone get? Does that have an effect on their wages? We have those so-called confounders that we have talked about in this course over and over again. Um, so these are variables that determine both what we call the treatment and the outcome. And so, for example, a student's ability or their parental background may determine um, their wages, and it also determines their education. And so if I run a regression with wages on the left, education on the right, I can't be sure, does my result reflect the fact that they have more education or simply just parents who... Uh, who, who gave them maybe a better start in life. This is a classic selection into treatment problem or the classic as it's also called endogeneity problem. In the sciences, you run an experiment, you randomize the treatment, then it's independent of the, of the confounder and you're done. And a few lectures ago, we have seen how this can be done, at least in theory. But when you don't have an experiment, what do you do? And so one of the techniques that, uh, that mainly David Card made very popular um, and that is now used in top journals in economics up and down is called difference in differences. So the idea of difference in differences is, is a very simple one. It may not be random which unit gets treated. So what does that mean? It means that for example, a policy change happens in some region and it may not be random why that policy change happens in that region and not in another. What can we do then? So we don't have an experiment. We don't have a suitable counterfactual. So what would have happened in that region where the policy changed had the policy not changed? And that's what we want. The idea of, uh, of difference in differences is that we extrapolate the counterfactual from a trend in another region that is a suitable, uh, a suitable control region. So this was the idea of uh, Card and Kruger's papers, paper on the effect of minimum wages on employment, um, which they published in 1994. So here is just in a, in a nutshell what they were studying. So what they were studying was that in New Jersey, uh, a minimum wage was introduced. And so th this, is, this is the theory behind the, the, um, the method. So what they want to know is economic theory would tell us if there is a higher minimum wage, firms hire fewer people because it's more expensive, so employment should go down. Okay. Um, problem is, what do we compare New Jersey with? Now, what they did was, first of all, they focused on a particular group of workers that have a very strong exposure to the minimum wage. Namely, they got data on workers in fast food restaurants, of whom many are earning wages that are close to the minimum wage. And then what they did, and that's the difference in difference approach, is they said, well, we need basically a counterfactual trend. Suppose this is the trend in employment in uh, New Jersey, where the, the minimum wage change happens. Now here have, is when the change happens and then economic theory predicts that employment will go down. What we need is the counterfactual. What would have happened to New Jersey had the minimum wage stayed the same? So basically we want to know what that, that dashed line here would be, right? Um, but that we don't observe because we only observe one New Jersey. There is not two. So what they did was they said, well, you know, before the change, 
when you look at the trend of employment in Pennsylvania, a neighboring state, Yes, the, the employment level was higher, but the trend was the same. So we can plausibly assume that the trend will continue and we can basically look at that trend and use it as a counterfactual and project it onto here. That's the idea of a difference in difference. As in we compare the difference after the change between a treated group and a control group relative to the difference before that change. And they did that. Now, they found an interesting result. So first of all, what they show in the paper, now there's lots of results in the paper, but they show just descriptively the distribution of wages in uh, New Jersey versus uh, Pennsylvania after the introduction of that minimum wage. The minimum wage was just over $5 an hour. And you can see, so, so those bars, the light ones are uh, Pennsylvania. The, Dark ones are New Jersey, and you can clearly see some bunching where the minimum wage bites. So there is no, no observations below, there is some observations above. Okay? And so, so clearly it shows the minimum wage had a bite. Surprisingly, though, what they did was, so when I just do this two by two comparison, I compare the difference Pennsylvania, New Jersey before the minimum wage was introduced relative to the difference after. What they find was, so here you have Pennsylvania, here you have New Jersey, here you have before, here you have after. Okay? And so what you see is that in Pennsylvania, um, employment went down in that time. In New Jersey, employment went up. And so their conclusion was that, in fact, employment increased after the minimum wage was introduced. Now, as you can imagine, this is a very uh, heavily contested finding until this day. It's also not the final uh, uh, truth. You know, we, we want to have obviously way more evidence on, um, on uh, the effect of minimum wages. And there are some studies that show that, yeah, if you, make, if you increase the minimum wage to a very high level, then you have negative employment effects. And in certain sectors, you have negative employment effects. And in others, they're, they're you know, positive or, or close to zero. Okay? But very clearly, what that study does is it rejects the notion that minimum wage increases must lead to, to losses in employment. And so so this, was, this was one example where they used a so-called research design, namely a difference in difference design, to tease out a causal effect. A second example that is often used, a second research design that is often used, is called a regression discontinuity design. The idea of that is also very simple. We often have in policies, we have certain threshold values. Whereas if, if, you're, if a certain variable that we call the assignment variable that is here on the x-axis, if it crosses that threshold, a change in the policy kicks in. So there are examples in, in, in tax laws. If your income is above a certain threshold, you pay a higher tax rate. If you, or in social benefits, if your income falls below a certain amount, you get more social benefits. Yeah, and the idea of that design is, you know, it's obviously not random who gets social benefits and who doesn't. Right? So those people who get social benefits, they, they may get them for various reasons and are very different people from those who don't, on average. The idea here is to say, well, um, those people that are just below that cut. And those people that are just above, if they can't manipulate who's where, you know, they are statistically very similar. And the only thing that's different is that some were just below and some were just above. Another example for that is admissions cutoffs in, in colleges. Right? So you have in the US colleges, for example, you have admissions cutoffs, you do a standardized test, and then those that, that perform slightly better on that test get into the college. Those that perform slightly less don't. But the people who are just above and below that cutoff, they're pretty much the same. That's the idea behind a regression discontinuity design. 
Now, here's an example from uh, Josh Angrist in, in collaboration with Victor Lavi, a, a, a British Israeli economist who has also worked very much on the economics of education. And I thought I'd choose this example because this is also what we have talked about in the course before. What is the effect of class sizes on student achievement? And we know that this is very, very difficult to answer in a causal manner because it's not random who goes to a school with small classes. Now, what these two economists have exploited here was a quirk in the way classes are assigned in schools in Israel. So what uh, the, the way the class assignment works is it follows a rule that is called Maimonides rule. Maimonides was a, a, a Hebrew philosopher uh, from the 12th century and of his many works, one was this rule about uh, assignment within schools, believe it or not. It is as follows. Suppose you have a starting cohort in a school. So there are a number of children who are enrolled. If the number is below 40, we have one class. But if the number exceeds 40, we split that the class becomes too big, we split it in two. Okay, so, so um, and then when the, the enrollment reaches 80, we split it in three. And so whenever it hits a multiple of 40, the class is split. So what can we compare here? We can compare schools where the starting, the, the, the incoming cohort was maybe 37, 38, 39, where you have then a huge class. We can compare those to schools that in a given year had just over 40. And again, these are statistically probably pretty similar. We always have to make this assumption that they're similar. This is not something we can test, but yeah, it seems plausible. And here is how they show this graphically. Now they run also regressions and so on, but, but a lot about causal inference is really thinking about what part of my context allows me to compare units that are statistically very similar, but one has been treated in this case with being in a small class and the other hasn't. So here you can see, this is just descriptive, basically the enrollment count. So across all the schools that they observe, how many people were in a school and then uh, how many, what is the average class size? And so the dashed line here, that sawtooth pattern is Maimonides rule. That's just using that formula. Whereas the, the, the solid line here is just what the actual class size is. And you can see that yeah, it doesn't follow it to the dot, but it does follow it. Okay? And what they did then was they looked at the following. They looked at average test scores. Now, again, in the paper, they run regressions and so on to show that. But I found this graph to be quite compelling. So here you have, again, the predicted class size is this line up here. And then the outcome, the test scores are down here. And they follow some sort of opposite sawtooth pattern. And then when you feed this into a regression, what comes out is that whenever the class size is very large, the test scores are low and vice versa. So exactly the effect we would expect, but here they can use this, they can basically compare places that are schools that are just here and just there that are actually fairly similar and, and simply compare the test scores of these, types, these two types of schools. And so you see these type of research designs a lot especially also, um, you know, when it comes to things like admissions cutoffs, because it is very, it is often implausible that such a big jump in an outcome is driven by anything except the actual treatment that we're studying. Okay, whether someone just gets into a better school or not, for example. Now, this all looks from today's perspective, like common sense. Yeah, those people are similar. Yeah, let's compare them. But to get to the idea and actually then to, to 
uh, develop methods that allow us to study that, that was the contribution of these price vectors. Now I'm gonna show you a third technique that is admittedly a little bit harder to understand. It's called instrumental variables. And the idea is that we have, a, we have this endogeneity problem here as we had before, but now we have a variable Z that determines the treatment, but has no relationship with the error term. What could that be? Um, let's say if D is my, is whether someone goes to the gym or not, I could run an experiment whereby I randomly give people vouchers to go to the gym for free. Okay? If I randomize those vouchers, that determines probably whether people go to the gym because those who get it for free, they, are, they may be more likely to go to the gym. At the same time, I've randomized the vouchers. So whether you get a voucher or not is independent of anything that determines your health. That's an example for an instrumental variable. Here is another one that, uh, that uh, again, Josh Angrist and, and, and Bill Evans have looked at in, again, a study that is very heavily cited. So here you see a regression equation, something that we've seen a lot. So what they wanna study is the effect of the number of children on female labor supply. And so the, the, what they wanna test is that basically if, if families have more children, do women in consequence work less? And if so, how much less? Or is that not true? Problem is again, that probably the number of children a family has and also the number of work hours are jointly driven by a lot of other factors. And depends on you know, the wealth of the family, the preferences of the family. You know, there are lots of cultural factors determining that. And there is obviously no experiment that we can run where we say, okay, this family has so many kids and this family has a different number of kids and we randomize that. Thankfully, we cannot do so, run such an experiment. As much as economics is called the dismal science, it's certainly not as dismal. So what did they do? They had a, an idea of exploiting one of the few lotteries we have in nature, which is the gender of children. So what they did was they looked at families who had two or more children. And they used as a so-called instrumental variable, the, the sex of the first two children. And the idea behind it is as follows. In many countries, and that study is in the US, so certainly there it's true, parents tend to have a preference for having mixed gender children, as in people prefer having a boy and a girl or a girl and a boy versus having two boys or two girls. And in consequence, what you observe is that parents whose first two children have the same gender, they are more likely to have a third child than parents who have a boy and a girl or a girl and a boy. And so they exploit this fact. Why? Well, how, well, how does it work? Well, whether the, first two, the two firstborn children are of the same sex is obviously random. And so, so is independent of any family characteristics. Yet it determines to a not large degree, but sufficient degree, how many children people have, families have. And that's what they do here in this, in this study. Okay, so we can see here, if we run a regression of the number of kids people have on a dummy, whether uh, the children, the first two children are of the same sex or not, we see a significant effect. It's not huge. It means that out of 14 families with children of the same sex, there is one that will have another child. Right? So it's not, it's not overly many, um, but it's, it's enough to you know, answer this question in a causal manner. And what they show then is that the effect of an additional child is actually quite large 
Okay, so what they compare, what they do is they compare basically families whose two first children had the same sex versus those who had a, a boy and a girl. Um, and when you make that comparison and scale it up in a way that is probably a bit too complicated for this, this course, um, at least at that stage that we're at, they find a pretty large effect. So an additional child going from two to three um, reduces the average number of work hours per woman per week by 5.5. When you do this with OLS, which is contaminated by other factors that determine it, you get an effect that is half as big. And now think about, you know, family policy in the US. Um, we are worried about uh, gender equality. We're worried about uh, distribution of, um, of workload within households or chores within households. If the result is a quite a small effect, as we will get if we just take a data set, run a regression down. If that's, if we get that uh, result, we would conclude, well, it's not such a big deal. But if we think carefully about eliminating those factors in the background, those confounding factors, we actually see that the effect can be quite large and quite substantial. Okay, but it's, it's covered up basically by, a, by confounding factors. And so this is again another example of how one can use clever research designs to study a and answer a causal question. Is this the final answer about kids and labor supply? No, it's one puzzle piece and obviously one needs more evidence from more countries, more regions, more years and so on to accumulate the evidence and draw conclusions about society at large, but it's a start. So to summarize, what these three economists, David Card, uh, Josh Angrist and, and Guido Immens have, have contributed was tremendous. Um, they have contributed methods of causal inference that are extremely important in policy advice in economic research, also in research in other social sciences. There are challenges, you know, for example, how much can we learn about uh, women who decide or who, who are on the fence between, you know, having a ch one child or none? We cannot learn anything from a study that compares people who have two and more children or so. Okay, so there is obviously uh, still methodological challenges about it. But it has changed, their work has changed how we think about empirical economics, and I would argue all for the better. Okay? And so um, I'm, I'm hoping you, you find their contribution interesting. I will also link um, some more articles on Brightspace that actually uh, summarize their, their uh, work probably even more succinctly than, than I can do that. Um, but you will see these, these methods popping up here in the course as we approach the end.